You like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. This episode is so satisfying, you should tell your grandmother you're not hungry. First story is about an entitled, gossipy witch who sabotages a totally legal, romantic relationship between a young man and his former teacher, ruins her career, and runs them both out of town. Her evil scheming seemed to go well. Until he found out, it was her. Followed by a story about a teacher that walks in on her colleagues embezzling money. But ends up getting wrongfully fired, after not joining their illegal activities. Lastly, a teacher with a short fuse, gets to sit on her favorite toilet, and experiences the big bang of her nightmare. Before we start, make sure to show hospitality to the like button, by offering it a fresh Coca-Cola beverage, but make sure to add ice cubes, with Mentos inside before serving. Let's dive in. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. I come from a really small town. Think of the littlest, most nothing happens here city extended layover in your flyover state nightmares, and my hometown is even more quiet than that. Think, half a mile or more between neighbors, a single main street downtown, one McDonald's, one department store, one movie theater with three screens, where everyone goes Friday and Saturday night. Church every Sunday, everyone knows everyone else, or at least knows their business, the whole city is invested in the fortunes of the high school football team, that sort of place. Graduating class of 60. Not because the senior class was dumb. It was just a tiny high school. I didn't really fit in at school, and I kind of was a loner by choice. I cringe about it now that I'm almost 26, but I was a wannabe emo slash goth rocker. I still got invited to party with the other kids, not because they liked me, necessarily. But because there just wasn't many people to invite. My mom baked cookies and cakes for church, and when she wasn't doing that, she cut hair in the town's one salon. My dad owned an internet cafe for a while when those were hot, once everyone got Wi-Fi, he turned it into a tax service. Business is always slow because most people did their own taxes, but he didn't really depend so much on his business. He served 20 years as a petty officer in the Navy, and so he and mom got by on his pension. In high school, I worked at the private burger place that competed mostly unsuccessfully against the town's single-chain fast food restaurant. My boss always told me I should ask my mom to cut my hair to stop looking like a dang girl. No thanks, old man. So, with all this boredom everywhere, you can imagine the sensation Miss Amber Fontaine caused when the high school hired her to be the 11th and 12th grade English teacher. Miss Fontaine was of French extraction, and had moved to America in her later teens to go to college in New York. She was only 24, and very beautiful. She spoke perfect English, but did so with a very pleasant accent. Obviously, all the guys loved her, and lots of women hated her. She appeared oblivious to all the attention, however, and just stuck to her job. Really, we didn't know too much about her. She mostly kept to herself and nobody ever saw her hanging out with any men in town, and it wasn't for lack of the men's trying. It soon became clear that she wasn't into dating any of the men our city had to offer. Much later on I found out that she had just taken the job in our small town to gain experience, with a future goal of being a college professor in a big city. A sort of two-year plan. Obviously I had a crush on her. We all did. It was and still is a small, church-going town, so nobody really acted out on his urges or tried to harass her or anything like that. As guys, we'd talk about how hot she was amongst ourselves, usual locker room stuff teenage boys do, but that was it. My one real out-of-school experience with Miss Fontaine was when she stopped by the burger joint I worked at and saw me working there. She told me I had a nice smile, and that she wished I smiled more because in school I was always frowning, because I was in my emo, everything sucks phase. When the food preppers came up with her food and handed it to me to give to her, I was impressed and not at all surprised that she ordered a salad. She didn't strike me as someone who ate the greasier slop we sold there. In school the following Monday she smiled at me in the hall and I smiled back. Then she said, you're learning, but not in a condescending or patronizing way. Just a fun, kidding way and I exchanged a smile with her every time after that. And that was the extent of my great, high school romance with Miss Fontaine. Exchanged a few hellos and smiles during my senior year, when I was 17. Things changed the following year though. I was 18 and still working at the burger joint, when Miss Fontaine comes by the restaurant. Oh hey, you. She says, and asks with real seriousness. Are you going to college? I tell her the truth. I'm working with my band, I cringe about this period in my life too, playing guitar, and saving money for community college. Only sort of truth about the last thing. 
Honestly, most of my money I spent on weed. I was the main vocalist in addition to being guitarist, and our band's only other members were Jerry the bassist and Gabe the drummer. Both of them were just out of high school, like me. And, like me, they had no plans to go to college. Gabe worked at the same burger joint as me, and Jerry, who had been one of my best friends in high school, ironically worked at the chain fast food restaurant down the street from my restaurant. Our lives at this time revolved around wasting our youth, skateboarding, getting high, and playing in our punk band. We like to think that we played an emo punk and metal fusion, but looking back our sound hasn't aged well. Miss Fontaine tells me that now she's in her second year of teaching, she has a better sense of how to do things. She tells me that she wished that her current students were as well behaved and put in as much effort as me. I earned mediocre grades throughout school but consistently earned an A in English because I like to read. She says she'll see me around. A few days later she comes into the restaurant again, and we get to talking, and she asks me if I'd like to go to a movie. I can tell she's bored because there's really no one her own age for her to hang out with in town, or if there are, they're all lame. I think we both get the feeling that it's natural we should hang out. And now that I was completely out of high school and she wasn't my teacher, and we were both adults, by this time I was newly 18 and she had just turned 25, why not? So, that's how it started. We meet up in the early evenings, totally innocent, and go to the movies, or to dinner at the one good restaurant in town. Miss Fontaine was cool about letting me slide when it came to paying for our dates, because she knew I made minimum wage. It was actually me, who started to push our relationship to the next level. After a while I started to hold her hand when we walked places, and finally we started kissing. Never in front of anyone. She taught me a lot of French words and phrases over the next summer and fall while we were going out. My parents knew I was sort of dating my former teacher, but since it was keyword former they didn't really raise any stink about it. Miss Fontaine would always try to convince me to go to college, but she did see our band play a few times when we got a rare gig at the roller rink, and she was nice enough to not tell us what she really thought of us. We didn't have sexy time until we had been dating casually for nearly two months. That was my idea, too, but she admitted that she really liked me and she wanted it to happen ever since we reconnected earlier that year. After I had graduated. I'm not the kiss and tell type, but my bandmates sort of knew that the dynamic in my relationship with Ms. Fontaine, she had been Amber ever since we first made out, had changed. They appeared cool with it. I stopped doing so much dope and really began putting money away to save for college. The JC near my house was super cheap. Amber would often tell me she thought about applying there for work, but said that she really wanted to move to the West Coast, or back to the East Coast to teach at a college. Eventually, she told me she'd like me to come with her. After a few months, I was in love with Amber and she was in love with me too, she said. We didn't throw our relationship in people's faces or show public affection, but it's not like we pretended not to know each other either. Amber had come around the house and my parents really liked her, and thought she was a great influence on me. I didn't exactly cut my hair, but I was neater and more presentable, and eventually I really did begin enrolling in GE classes at the local two-year. But then, things went downhill fast. Out of seemingly nowhere, Amber got called in for a meeting with the local school board. This is my secondary account of the situation, as Amber was the one there, not me. There had been reports that she was dating a former student romantically, they were talking about me. And that she was having a sexy time relationship with said student when he was still a minor and still attending high school. Of course, she denied everything. Of course, they believed nothing. She had sent me a desperate text, and since ours is a small town, I think I've mentioned that a couple of times already. I was at that meeting in literally 10 minutes. I told them the truth, that I was in Miss Fontaine's class in 12th grade, and that I was her student. That was all. I told the truth that we reconnected several months after graduation, and only then did we begin dating. And I was over 18. The opinion of the board was essentially, look son, we appreciate the noble effort you're making to defend your friend's honor, but we're looking for the truth here, not omissions. I insisted that I was telling the truth and not trying to cover anything up. After a lot of tears, Amber was simply warned that it wasn't becoming of a teacher to be seen with students outside campus, even if they're former students. And we assumed that was all. We were really wondering who complained about us, or who would make up tales about us having sexy time while I was still a minor and a student of Amber's. I was staying at Amber's apartment by this time, I kicked in a portion of the rent of course. I had even met her parents, albeit only on webcam. They're good people. They don't speak a lot of English, but Amber filled them in on missing pieces. They knew my age and they were cool about it. 
we assumed it was just small town gossip and that it would blow over. Boy, were we wrong. Over the next several weeks after Amber's meeting with the school board, vicious rumors started to spread about her. I won't insult your imagination. You know what people were saying. One day my boss at the burger joint just told me he had to let me go. Some cheap excuse about the store losing money, and my hairstyle was driving away customers. Whatever, dude. Amber told me it wasn't my fault, and promised to support me while I looked for another job. But then one day, she got fired, too. She was working as a probationary teacher. It meant that during her first two years, she could be fired for any reason, and actually, no reason had to even be given. Explanations were for those who earned tenure. We both knew why she was getting fired, but the district strongly implied that it was simply because she was an ineffective teacher. In her defense, I looked at the data on the district website, and the number of students from our school who did well on standardized tests in her subject area leapt by double-digit points during the time she was a teacher there. Her numbers were far above the state average, and to this day, since her departure, those same scores have nosedived. Amber told me that students tended to respond well to her, and she was very popular among the students. It was true that she was immensely popular when I was a student, and I'll assume the same carried true the year after I graduated. Aside from the obvious fact that she was eye candy, she was simply a good teacher, and a good person, and that's why the kids liked her. Lots of students threatened to write when she was fired. But being the non-dramatic, non-attention-seeking person she is, Amber asked them to just focus on their studies and doing well, and helping their new teacher adjust when he or she arrived to take her place. My dad told her she ought to sue the district, but Amber didn't want the drama. Besides, she said, she was allowed to resign so that it wouldn't show up on her record as her having been fired. Also, she said that the district promised not to try to revoke her teaching credential. Her own parents suggested maybe she ought to come home to France, but she insisted on sticking it out in America. My parents were cool in that they offered to let her move in with us while she figured her life out. She's lucky that her parents are well off, because they gave her some money to relocate to California. She asked me please to come with her, that she loved me, and we could start new there. I've always wanted to move to California, so I jumped at the chance. My parents were happy that I was in a relationship with a good person who obviously cared about me, and gave us some money too. We got an apartment together in the Los Angeles area. Neither of us drove, so we both got bikes to get around. Our new area was a world apart from my old life, though I know Amber's own teenage years were in Paris, so Los Angeles wouldn't be as much of a culture shock for her. I immediately enrolled in a local community college and got a job as a waiter in a popular French restaurant. Our gimmick was that some of the servers actually spoke French. Over the last several months Amber had taught me a lot of French, so I was a popular server in that restaurant because I gave it authenticity. Unfortunately for Amber, the school district misled her about her teaching license. When they promised not to have her license revoked, they spoke the truth, but they left out the part where they would attach an official reprimand to it, that accused her of inappropriate relations with students under her charge. So, whenever Amber applied for teaching jobs, this would immediately come up as a red flag on her applications. Another surprise red flag was that schools that she applied to would notice that she was fired from her last job. No I wasn't, she'd say. I resigned. Yeah, but it says here you were forced to resign to avoid termination for cause. Amber is 7 years older than me, but I think in some ways I know a lot more about how nasty Americans can be than her. Everywhere she went, doors would slam, career-wise. She appealed to the state teaching license organization, and they said they'd look into it, but months later, nothing came up. Calls to her former school resulted in her getting the runaround. No one knew anything. So, for the next several months I was paying our day-to-day -day bills and helping to support Amber, though I must acknowledge that the loans both our sets of parents gave us help tremendously, and we couldn't survive without them. Finally, one day, Amber tells me. You know what? Frick trying to teach public school. Oh, and OP, I'm pregnant. So, two pieces of good news. Many, many months later, Amber and I are happily married. Wedding was beautiful, in sunny Los Angeles. Amber's parents and mine and our families all attended. We had a pregnant honeymoon in France. We now have a son. I am closing in on earning my AA in information technology. I've been promoted at the restaurant and have health benefits for my wife and son. We live in a studio apartment, but at least it's a huge studio, and it's enough for now. Amber stays home with the baby, but she also teaches online English and French courses for a private school. 
So, even though she's blacklisted from teaching in the public K-12 district, she can still teach, which is her passion. More months pass, and I got my first job in IT, troubleshooting computers for a small company downtown. I make double what I used to at the restaurant, and my employer has a program where I can finish my BA while I work, and they will subsidize 50% for free, and the other 50% they will dock from my pay in small monthly installments. Sounds like an amazing deal, and I take it. We move to a bigger apartment. Amber is making her awesome contribution both as a mother and to our finances with her tutoring. We're planning for her to eventually go back to school for her graduate degree so she can finally fulfill her dream of teaching college. Oh, more good news, OP. I'm pregnant again. Life is sweet. So, while everything is going awesome, one day I get a text from mom. She was at a local school board meeting with her neighbors, regarding a bill proposal to hire more teachers. Apparently over the past few years, the population has grown, and the high school needed to expand. So now it's a two-horse town, mom says. While she was at the meeting, my mom ran into Jerry's mom. Jerry, the bassist from my old band that I quit once I got into a serious relationship with Amber. My mom never met Jerry, or his mom. Or at least in a way that connected them to me. The reason was, because I never brought Jerry around our house. Because, for a couple of years, Jerry was my drug supplier. He had the hookup for anything you wanted. Well what does all this have to do with anything? My mom doesn't know Jerry's mom, but she hears her and some other lady talking about me, and Amber. My mom heard them saying that Jerry had been the one to tell everyone about Amber and me supposedly having sexy time before I graduated, and his mom went straight to the school board. Their names as informers were protected under confidentiality. I had lost touch with Jerry over the years and had stopped playing music with him long ago. I knew he resented all the time I was spending with my chick. It's a shame because he used to be such a good friend of mine. It sucked that he was behind getting my now wife and mother of my child, and soon to be children, fired from her career. Jerry's mom was a teacher at Amber's former school of employment. It became a joke of ours, that his mom had such a huge stick up her booty regarding prim and proper behavior, and was a goody two-shoes teacher whose duty didn't stink. Yet her kid Jerry, a student at her school, is basically the biggest drug dealer in town. Also, looking back, I know he had a crush on Amber too, and probably always resented that I got to be in a relationship with her, while he didn't. Maybe it's because she knows quality, you jerk. I was interested to learn that Jerry's mom was now on the school board. I didn't tell Amber about all this right away. I just asked her to tell me what she remembered about Mrs. Goody Two Shoes aka Jerry's mom. She told me that Jerry's mom was always really mean to her, and often one of the main instigators in getting everyone. The adults, on campus to exclude her from teacher social activities. It's one of the main reasons why Amber didn't make friends with the other teachers. Amber tells me that the male teachers tended to be nice to her at first, but female teachers overwhelmingly despised her before they even knew her. Jerry's mom, Amber told me, was also the teacher she knows who started a petition not to renew her contract for even a second year at the school. This was the first I heard about this. Evidently only a few female teachers signed the petition, but the petition was placed in Amber's permanent file as evidence that the staff lacked confidence in her. They were basically setting her up to be fired even though she was doing a good job teaching, and the students liked her. Well, I'm more Cali than Iowa these days, but I still keep in touch with a few kids, now grown up, I knew in school, including Gabe the drummer from our old band. From what I hear, Jerry manages the burger joint I used to work at, because the old guy who owns it retired. I have a social media account but only use it to contact people in emergencies. I never update anything. My profile is practically blank, online. I'm not one of those people who checks it daily or uploads pics of my lunch. Didn't post about marrying or having kids or moving to LA. I told the people that matter directly. Jerry was still my friend on social media even though we stopped talking ages ago, so I clicked on his profile. Yep, he definitely managed my old place of employment. I clicked on his friends and family's profiles and recognized his mom, my old history teacher. She was on the school board now. Sanctimonious as ever. I think I mentioned before that I came from a small town. And in a small town, there often isn't anything for bored kids to do other than do dumb stunts and do drugs. And for the biggest loser kids of all, a group that included me, we were dumb enough to record ourselves partying and talking crap and doing the aforementioned drugs. That's exactly what my band used to do all the time. Whenever we had a show, we'd go around taping ourselves using our cell phones. 
We take video of us rocking out, skating, drinking beer in the vacant lot, and take video of us getting high. We'd also talk to the camera. I haven't thought about the old recordings in years, but I never erase them from my old phones. I'm the kind of guy who hoards his old cell phones. Not because I think they'll increase in value or that I find them especially interesting, but I kind of think of them like file cabinets of my past, because I don't erase anything. Aside from phone numbers, I don't really transfer data from one phone to its successor, easy as it would be. My current boss knows I used to get lit and they don't care. In IT, I'm told, everyone used to get lit and many still do. I asked my wife, offhand, if her new job knows about what happened in our old town. She says yeah, but that they don't care about any of that. They only care that she teaches expert level conversational French. That's what their clients, many of them traveling professionals, demand. Many of her coworkers, she tells me, had real felonies on their records, but her employer was a firm believer in rehabilitation. Copacetic. So I check some of my old videos and find what I need. I have no trouble finding videos of Jerry getting high as a kite. That's like practically every video. And in practically every video, he brags about how his parents know he's a druggie and a dealer and want to ship him off to the army and make a man out of him. The video I really want is. Nope, it's not on this phone. Maybe the LG? Nope, just more of Jerry rolling on ecstasy at a rave we snuck out of state to attend when we were in 11th grade. Maybe my old galaxy? Bingo. Jerry talks about how his mom knows all about his drug use and sometimes even smokes weed herself, with his dad. And how they caught him with cocaine once and yelled at him and his dad kicked his booty, but then Jerry came home the next day from school, to find that his mom was coked out on the kitchen table. And she had called in sick that day. The video was timestamped. I think that'll do. I still don't tell Amber. It would only upset her, in her condition. But I asked my mom for the contact info of all the people who are on the little town school board. I already know the school's basic email address, and I graduated not that long ago and most of the administrators are still mid-career at my former high school. I still have their emails. I make a throwaway email account and attach all the relevant videos to it and send it to everyone that matters in town. All the teachers, the administrators, even from elementary and middle schools, the church, the pizza place, the burger joint owner, the roller rink boss, you name it, they got the files. The files where Jerry exposes himself as a coked out drug dealer, with his mom having full knowledge of the fact. And her and her husband even indulging in the drugs themselves. The next day Amber asks me, while she's feeding our son. Honey, why are you so happy? So I tell her, and she starts crying. No. I'm not sad. She assures me. I'm just so happy you did this for me. Then me, Amber, our son, and our bun in the oven go for a walk because it's such a nice day. Still need a haircut. Not getting one. Do I even need to say what happened afterward? All this ancient history shouldn't matter. But in a small town, it's devastating. The videos are just of Jerry talking trash, who knows if he's even telling the truth. Doesn't matter. In a small town, gossip becomes gospel. Kind of like how everyone believed Amber and I were sexy timing before I turned 18, even though that was 0% true and a lie, and they ran us out of town on a rail. My parents had to endure the fallout of my disgrace when I left town years ago with that French outcast, as all the idle busybodies have dubbed my wife. Mom and dad made their peace with it and have numbed themselves to the slurs, and always stood up for us. They are what's good about small town America. Jerry got fired from his job. Police searched his house, that is to say, his mom's house, and found a lot of narcotics. Evidently when the rumors went flying that Mrs. Jerry's mom had a drug dealing son, kids busted for drugs at the high school caved under pressure to admit who hooked them up. Oopsie. So he was telling the truth. Jail for you, you banana blocking scumbag. His mom was summarily dismissed from her job, along with all the appropriate blacklisting that being a drug abusing, child endangering, fraud committing public official entails. My mom wasn't clear on the details, but there's a possibility she and her husband might face jail time too. During their life falling apart, it came out that Jerry's dad had been cheating on his wife for years with a woman from the church. Jerry's whole family are persona non grata. They want to leave town, but can't due to a pending court case. Until then, they'll just be hated to their face. I'll hate them from across the country. Small town. Everyone knows everyone. Or, at least their business. Which means sooner or later word will slip, people will drop the it's confidential charade and figure out that I was responsible for a family's downfall. 
I don't give a flying frick. Jerry, you listening? Wonderful. Come at me, bro. I'll start off by saying this happened to my sister, and the actions taken were hers. My sister has always gotten along very well with her teachers, and has a habit of forming actual friendships with them, to the point that she still talks to her fifth grade English teacher, along with many others, decades later. This happened about 15 years ago. My sister was a student at Job Corps, a government-run live-on-campus vocational training program, studying hotel management. She got on extremely well with her hotel management teacher, better than pretty much every teacher she'd already had up to that point. One day, the teacher goes to the center's dean's office and walks in on a paper shredding session. It turned out that there was some pretty major embezzling happening at the center, as in more than 60% of the funds for the center were being stolen. The teacher was appalled, and despite some rather lucrative offers made, refused to join in on these acts. Less than a week later, the teacher was fired for trumped up reasons. This was especially bad given the teacher was only two years away from retiring, and being fired lost their retirement package. Needless to say, my sister was pissed. Knowing how things typically work, and that almost any report she tried to make would just be swept under the rug, if it was taken seriously at all, she came up with a plan and took things nuclear. Over the next month or two, my sister managed to gather some basic evidence of the embezzling, nothing concrete, but enough to warrant considerable investigation by the authorities. She took the little evidence she was able to gather, along with the story of what happened to her teacher, and sent the info in an email to the Job Corps regional director. Now like I said, she knew that her email would likely be ignored, or the event swept under the rug, so she got smart. The email was cc'd to every single major person in the Job Corps chain of command, all the way up to the national director, as well as to anyone even tangentially related to Job Corps in the upper echelons of the Department of Labor, and every member of Congress, as well as the U.S. President's office, remember, this was a government-run program. All in all, the email was sent to over 2,000 people. Basically, she not only sent the report, but sent it in such a way that everyone who got it could also see everyone else who got it, and she sent it to way more people than would be needed to ensure the issue couldn't be swept under the rug. Two weeks later, after the investigation finished, never seen the government work so fast on anything that wasn't collecting owed taxes, only five or six staff members, out of around 20 that worked in the center, still had their jobs. And at least five of the ones fired, including the dean, were facing major criminal charges, with the rest facing minor charges. I'm not sure of the exact figure on how much was stolen, but it was well into the seven digits, the embezzling had been happening for years. The teacher got a very nice severance package post-investigation, ERC, it was three year of pay, her full retirement package, and signing an NDA, though she didn't get her job back. My sister was given her completion certificate, despite not having finished the requirements of the course. They wanted her gone, but couldn't kick her out. This is not my story, but for my educational advisor, one of the legit funniest people I have ever met. She was 14 at the time of this story, she's almost 52 years now, so bear in mind I can't get too detailed, but it's crazy nonetheless. The other day, we were talking about our school times and the differences between being educators and students, when she started telling this story. She used to be the model student, getting along with all the teachers and getting the best grades in her classroom, but there was that one teacher she could not get along with. It was her chemistry teacher, and she described her as, all teachers have that breaking point where they just start screaming, but hers was incredibly easy to reach. Until the point of the start of the story, she was just a disliked teacher and someone my advisor just dealt with. But one day, she reached her breaking point when her brother told her, this teacher, which I'm gonna be calling rude teacher, was calling him stupid and screaming at him for not knowing an answer she hadn't even explained properly yet. That was when she got involved in a plan. The famous toilet bomb. Because of the shared gender with the teacher, she knew where and when rude teacher would use the restroom. She had a strange routine with the exact time and stall she used to use. And because she was a model student, she could come and go without being even noticed, since no one would assume she was up to no good. Thing is, the whole class wasn't on it. Before she got involved with the plan though, there was a single condition, no one would rat or blame someone else. No one was supposed to talk about it anytime or anywhere. She had a plan and the toilet bomb found its way into the designated toilet. My advisor went to the stall, installed the toilet bomb and went back to class at the exact time rude teacher had her restroom break. 
When she came back from doing the deed, she sits down at her desk and hears the explosion, followed by rude teacher screaming bloody murder and coming back to class to scream at them. The only classroom that was on break for teacher transition was my advisor's class, so rude teacher beelined straight to them and started demanding to know who did this. Of course, she only got radio silence. She jumped in anger like a toddler, made all threats she could legally do and made the biggest tantrum you could imagine, while being absolutely soaked in toilet water. Radio silence, still. The next logical step for rude teacher was to call the principal, that arrived at class with a box filled with pieces of paper. She explained that everyone was to write the name of someone involved, and put it in the box, so it would be read out loud by her by the end of class. That was when my advisor stepped in. The second the principal was out of the class, she told everyone to just write it was me in capital letters and put the paper back in the box. Which everyone did. When the principal came back and started looking at the papers, in front of the class, she slowly turned from a normal color to a deep, fiery red and started throwing her own tantrum. Guess they found out her breaking point, and did the only thing she could do at that point, she suspended the whole damn class for three days. In the end, my advisor did everything, blew up the toilet, lead the class to not snitch on anyone and earn three days at home without anyone suspecting anything. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe to receive future episodes, and tickle the like button for good karma. Do you have any experiences surrounding this topic? Share yours below, I'll join the conversation. And I'll be seeing you, in the next one.